Now I should say, uh, the reason I'm putting this uh, um, image processing in quotes is because the, uh, what we've sort of traditionally called image processing has um, really evolved um, and merged in many ways with lots of other activities. So going back, we've had a lot of work traditionally in the signal processing community on this topic, and more recently in computational <coughs> photography, where in fact computational photography more or less is image processing which is published in SIGGRAPH. Right? So um, that's another way to think about it. So one of the key concepts that's recently become very popular is this idea of non-local means. Some of you may have heard about it. Um, now going on to computer vision, we've had um, algorithms that have been developed in the, uh, in, in the vision community for anisotropic diffusion. We're all probably familiar to some extent or another with these things. Uh, the bilateral filter, which has now found applications in lots of places, including graphics. Um, <clears throat> now going to graphics, there's been the idea of movingly squares for interpolating 3D scan data into smooth surfaces. People have been using this in graphics for a long, long time, and it turns out we've been using it in image processing, and people in vision have been using a similar idea, but just calling it different things. <clears throat> and then you have ideas from machine learning and statistics, including boosting, spectral clustering, and various other concepts that have, again, found their way into what we traditionally called image processing. And also, uh, in applied math, um, fairly recently there's been a lot of interest. In fact, the SIAM Journal on Imaging Science is a new journal that publishes image processing. Uh, things with a heavy mathematical bent. So really, there's been a convergence of ideas across a lot of different fields, and, and hopefully uh, my presentation will give you a, a, at least a rough idea of, of how these ideas all relate to each other. Okay, so let me, uh, at least from my per perspective, give you an overview of the computational problems in imaging that, that we deal with. So typically you have a, a real scene which gets blurred and downsampled and, and uh, noisy, and the measurements may look like this, and then what we might call inverse problems or uh, reconstruction problems could be just denoising, it could be upscaling or interpolation, it could be deblurring. Um, for the purposes of this talk, I'll be concentrating on the denoising problems, but uh, a lot of what I say will have applications and, in fact, direct use in a bunch of these other areas as well. So the framework is general enough to, to sort of subsume algorithms in all of these different uh, applications. Okay, so um, let me get down to the specifics a little bit. The common uh, framework for all of these concepts is um, basically non-parametric ways of estimating functions uh, or point estimation procedures uh, as, as they are known in statistics. So the problem is a data fitting problem. So let's imagine, uh, like I said, uh, the problem of denoising where you're given an image um, or a video and you'd like to reduce the amount of noise present in this data. So let's say yi here are the pixels uh, that are noisy. Um, uh, Z of xi are pixel values at some position xi, and then E here is the error. So uh, the data model is like this. So as I said, these are the samples. This is what we call, Z is what we call the regression function, the function we, we sort of try to fit. Um, and the noise, we just assume it to be zero mean, IID noise, but we make no other distributional assumptions. So I'm not assuming the noise is Gaussian or Laplacian or anything, um, uh, just that. So if you look at this picture, the idea is that you have a bunch of data points, and what you'd like to do is to estimate the value of the function at a particular point um, given this data. So now this data I've denoted here y1, y2, through yn, uh, this data, could be the entire image, or it could be just some patch of the image, right? So um, essentially what you're interested in is estimating the value of one pixel given either the whole image or some patch of the image. And the particular form of z of x uh, is going to remain unspecified for the time being, and this is actually part of the strength of this, is that we are not using a model-based approach. In typical uh, traditional approaches in, in image processing, what we've done is we've sort of assumed some kind of parametric or global model for z of x and then gone after estimating those parameters. Okay, here, not, that's not what we're doing. We're estimating the values of z one point at a time. Okay, so uh, once again, you have this data, and uh, one very simple way to estimate the value of this scalar, and remember this is just a scalar pixel value, is to do um, a very elementary least squares. 
Okay? So if I just write this least squares cost function and minimize it over the scalar z of xj, then the solution would just be the average of, of the pixel values that I'm given. Right? So that's not very exciting. Now, um, going one step further from this, you might say, well, uh, this formulation actually gives equal weight to all the data. Right? So if you solve this, you just get the average. So the weight in front of each of the data points is just 1 over n. So why not give different weights to the data? And so that gives rise to a weight function k. This is what we call the kernel. Um, and this weight function is not going to make this a weighted least squares problem. Okay? Not terribly more complicated than before. The only difference is that this weight function is now somehow going to measure similarity between <laughs> the data points at j, which you have, and the data points around it, and in some sense penalizes things that are not similar enough to this location at hand. Okay? Now, the way this particular function uh, is measured is going to give you a cacophony of different types of algorithms, many of which you'll be immediately familiar with. Okay, so the bottom line here is it's very simple. It's just a weighted least squares formulation, but it leads to a lot of interesting insights. All right, so let me go sort of the next step. <clears throat> so let's write the weighted least squares problem in this uh, vector notation. So I'm going to stack all the data y1 through yn in this vector y. Um, I'm going to define this vector of 1s as 1 sub n. And then uh, the values of this kernel function uh, are going to be stacked into a diagonal uh, of this diagonal matrix kj. And so I can write this quadratic cost function to minimize. And when I um, do this simple minimization, what I get is the value of the pixel at xj is just this expression on the right-hand side. Okay, and writing it sort of in longhand, what you have is um, a sum of a bunch of coefficients times the data points. Okay? Now, what's interesting here is that if you look at these uh, data points, if you look at these costs, sorry, if you look at these weights, um, the weights are normalized. Okay, uh, so they sum up to one. They're also positive. Okay, and here the way I've written it, the weights are, are a function of the positions and also the actual gray values at those positions. Okay, so they're fairly general. Um, the bottom line here is that the solution to this optimization problem is a convex combination of all the data that you considered. Convex because uh, these weights are positive and they also sum up to one. Okay. So this is basically an optimization problem we solve for estimating every pixel value that we're interested in. And we sort of move this optimization problem around. And in fact, this is exactly what the, way, uh, what the um, moving least squares idea in, in graphics is as well. This is just the weighted least squares, and you move it around the image, and you get your answer. OK, so I'm just going to write this as a vector vector uh, inner product, where this W just contains these weights, uh, and the Y again contains all the data. OK? All right, so now let's see what happens if we make different choices for this, for this kernel function. OK, so here's the simplest case. If you take this kernel function to be a simple exponential, uh, with the exponent being the uh, spatial distance, sort of the uh, Euclidean distance between the two spatial positions where these two samples are, if you want to measure the similarity between these two and you use this metric, then all you're using is uh, the, the, uh, the, the Euclidean distance. What you get is the classical Gaussian linear filters that we all know from basic uh, sort of signals and systems or signal processing. OK, um, now uh, I should also say that these filters, even though they're linear, could be spatially varying. Right? So depending on uh, how your data is sampled, if your data is sampled regularly, um, then that's fine, but if the data is sampled uh, irregularly, then depending on where you center this J, then uh, the, the profile of these weight functions can change depending on the density of the samples around you. So they, they're linear, but they can be uh, shift varying. Now, if you not only include the spatial distance, but also the photometric distance, namely the gray value difference between these pixels, uh, you get the filters uh, that are the bilateral filter and non-local means. And these two things turn out to be very, very similar in, in principle to one another. In fact, what they do is they pick a Gaussian for the distance between, uh, for the, for the uh, photometric kernel and a Gaussian for the spatial kernel. And they literally multiply these 
And the net effect of that is that you're measuring the Euclidean distance between these two points as opposed to just the x distance or the y distance, okay? So here's a, a quick example of the bilateral filter. The spatial distance, I'm, I'm showing these, uh, the values of these kernels in non-overlapping patches just for convenience of illustration. Typically, these things are measured in a dense fashion all the way across the image. So this term is just the spatial similarity. This term here is the photometric similarity. And then these two things get multiplied point by point, and you get this uh, arrangement of kernels, which is then used for uh, constructing the filters. OK, now if you go to non-local means, uh, which has made a big splash in, in our community in the last uh, a few years, the difference is really minor. The only thing that's changed is that instead of taking the pixel-wise differences here, you take the differences between two patches centered at that pixel. And also, you let this hx go to infinity, which is what makes it non-local, right? So if this is some small number, then you're looking in a, uh, the weights are large only in a, in a small spatial area around the pixel of interest. But if you let that go to a large number, then you're looking all over the image, okay? And so the, the result here is that you, can, you get kind of a smoothing effect from the bilateral to, the, um, to, to this other scenario. Um, now, another special case is something that uh, both uh, Kimmel and, and his group and, and, and our group have come up with, uh, namely the Beltrami flow kernel and LARC for locally adaptive regression kernels. And the idea here is that instead of measuring the Euclidean distance between these two points, what we instead do is we estimate the geodesic distance between the two points, given the intermediate points. So let me be a little bit more specific about how we do this. Our kernel looks like this. So it's a quadratic again in the exponent, except for the fact that we have, there's a sort of inverse covariance matrix sitting in the exponent here. And this covariance matrix is basically the covariance of the local gradient estimates. So we take the pixel and we estimate the gradients and we compute a covariance from that. And this is, uh, if you're a little bit familiar with the, the literature, this is just called the structure tensor in, in a lot of uh, imaging work and, and machine vision work. It's also known as the metric tensor. In fact, if you think about it, this quadratic function here is nothing but a learned distance metric. So all the work that uh, is, is being done in machine learning for uh, distance metric learning is, uh, this is a very, very simple case of learning a, a, a simple geodesic distance. So but what it's doing is measuring the nearest, uh, measuring the shortest distance between two points on the manifold on which the image sits. And so what this does is it actually produces something more sophisticated um, that is both better than the bilateral and the non-local means in the sense that it retains details, but at the same time um, also gets rid of some of the um, sort of uh, uh, instability with respect to noise and so on. Okay. So um, now let's think about this formulation that I just gave you and see some various ways in which we can um, generalize these ideas. So one would be, um, if you take this uh, general formulation for the Gaussian kernel, um, if you take this Q to be a block diagonal matrix, now if you, sh if you allow this QX and QY to be various different uh, matrices, all of the filters that I just described to you are special cases. So the classical would be just this QX's identity and QY would be zero and so on. Okay, so this, this simple formulation actually captures uh, probably, I don't know, three, four hundred different papers um, in, in all these different uh, areas. So this is one simple way to, uh, to, to look at a generalization. Now, you can also do various other things. Uh, you just pick this Q to be a symmetric positive definite matrix. Um, you could certainly introduce off-diagonal elements. So no algorithms currently exist for doing anything like that right now. Um, it's not necessarily the case that if you introduce off diagonal elements, you would get a better algorithm, which is probably why it hasn't been done. Um, another thing you could do is uh, this T here, the way I defined it before, uh, if I just skip back, it's simply a concatenation of the position and the gray value of the pixels. It doesn't have to be. Uh, this T can be any feature that you like. Uh, remember, all the kernel is doing is measuring a similarity between two pixels. And here I've just chosen this particular way of uh, <coughs> Uh, selecting T, but it doesn't have to be. And finally, you can also uh, use the idea of reproducing kernels to come up with a much more general uh, uh, 
formulation. Namely, um, the, the class of admissible kernels that you can use are functions that are symmetric in their arguments and they're positive definite in the sense that for any collection of n samples, this gram matrix, Kij, uh, is symmetric positive definite. So if you design a K in this fashion, it doesn't have to be e to the minus something. It's generally going to be valid. Um, and in fact, if you designed, if you have two uh, admissible kernels, then you can have an endless number of new constructions by doing things like uh, a positive linear combination of the two kernels or product of the two kernels or any number of different things. So th the reason I'm bringing all of this up is just to put in perspective the idea that things like the bilateral filter and the non-local means and so on, these are tiny, tiny special cases of some, uh, something very, very broad that can be done. Um, Okay, so um, before going any further, let me uh, sort of back off uh, the, the equations a little bit and show you some examples. Uh, we've applied these ideas to a lot of different uh, applications. Uh, I'm going to show you some examples just for denoising and for focus stacking. We've also applied it to interpolation and super resolution and deblurring. And these two things, in fact, we've commercialized in a company that we started five years ago, which produces software for doing video enhancement for lots of different applications. Okay, so for denoising, let me give you an example. So here's a, uh, a photo of, of JFK. Um, this is actually a, uh, a real 35 millimeter photo that has been scanned to digital form. So certainly the noise in this image is not Gaussian. Uh, it's not even uncorrelated. Um, it's in fact a combination of film grain noise and uh, scanning artifacts and so on. So here's the noisy image, and here's the denoise version using our algorithm, which uses this locally adaptive regression kernel. So let me just go back and forth. Um, as you can see, you know, the fidelity is very, very high. Um, you can hardly tell the difference. You'd have to look at this image for a, for a fair amount of time to see the difference. And in fact, it's interesting if now you, you kind of scan the literature and look at the uh, algorithms that are sort of state of the art, um, so here's a plot that shows you the mean squared error. Now, for that case, I couldn't show you the mean squared error because the, the image is just given to us. I don't have the ground truth. But if you do a bunch of uh, Monte Carlo simulations, you can look at the mean squared error versus the standard deviation of the noise added to the image. And what you see is that sort of the top few algorithms that are out there for uh, denoising are sort of clumped together in a very tight band um, and we've also uh, done a paper called Is Denoising Dead, which uh, came out a, a few months ago, where we computed um, lower bounds, kramer our lower bounds. And what we've noticed is that uh, all of these algorithms are, are very tightly bunched, but there's still room for improvement depending on the type of image that you have. And also later on, uh, Boaz Nadler's talk uh, in this uh, session will also give a, another perspective on, uh, on these ideas as well. Question. Yeah. Um, Previous example you showed, do you mm -hmm. do the denoising in the full RGB space or do you do it separately on the different channels? We actually um, transfer the image to YCBCR, do it there, and then transfer back to RGB. Typically, do different chroma luma parameters. Well, yeah, so, so what you want to do is to be much more careful about the, the, the luminance channel. The chrominance channel makes much less difference. So we can, you can be more aggressive in denoising in the chroma channels. Okay, so another quick application. Now, this is something that um, is a common problem that's been around for a long time. Uh, when you have limited depth of focus, one of the things you can do is take multiple images with different uh, focal lengths and then combine these images together. And these ideas, this sort of uh, regression uh, weighted least squares idea that I talked about, doesn't have to be done just for uh, it, just in space. If you have multiple images, this can also be done. Uh, if the multiple images are in time, it can also be done in time or in any other dimension. In this case, it happens to be focal length. So we've also used this, uh, these ideas to combine these images together to get one fully focused image. And this is the idea that's been around in uh, microscopy for, for a long time. We have a very simple solution to it that works really well. It's just the extension of some of the algorithms I showed you with a proper weight selection. And the weight selection basically measures how close the different pieces of the different images are in terms of how sharp or blurry they are. And so what it does is it ends up ma managing to combine the sharpest parts of all of these images together to give you this result. Does it assume the registration problem? It assumes the registration problem solved. That's right. <clears throat> okay, so here 
Uh, let me go back now to the matrix formulation and talk about the mathematics a little bit more. Um, so now let's take this formulation that we had, which was this uh, linear combination of, uh, of all the pixels. And also let me remind you, even though this is a linear combination, these weights W are actually a function of the data. So this is uh, not really a linear filter, but it just sort of looks that way. Okay, so now if I take all of these weight functions and I stack them into a matrix, um, I can write the whole image z hat, the whole reconstructed image z hat, uh, as a function of the input noisy image y with a matrix w. And this matrix w is going to be generally data dependent. Okay, so from this point on, I'm gonna be working with this equation z hat equals w times y. And what I wanna do is talk about the properties of this matrix w. Um, so let's discuss this. W is a very special matrix. Uh, this is just a reminder of what uh, each uh, row of this matrix W does. One way we can rewrite this uh, in matrix form is to write W as D inverse K, where K is the matrix Kij, and D inverse is just a diagonal matrix which has the normalization factors uh, simply along its diagonal, okay? So this is just the shorthand way of writing the whole thing all at once. Now, um, I can factor this d inverse k by breaking up the inverse into d to the minus one half, d to the minus one half, and then uh, putting a, an, uh, factoring the identity into d to the minus half, d to the one half, and writing this w in this fashion. Now it turns out that this d to the mi minus one, sorry, d to the one half is positive definite, and because k is positive definite, and this is just uh, a product of it on the left and right with positive definite diagonal matrices, then both L and D to the minus one half, D to the one half are positive definite, so it turns out W is in fact a positive definite matrix as well. So, but W is positive definite, but it is not symmetric. Okay, this is a little bit uh, sort of unexpected in a sense. So it's positive definite because it inherits that property from K, but if you simply look at this equation here, you can see that K is symmetric positive definite, but because it gets multiplied on the left by a D inverse, W can't be symmetric, but it still is positive definite because of this decomposition. So that's kind of interesting. Um, it turns out that even though W is not symmetric, it is very close to being symmetric, and I will make that precise very shortly. And it turns out approximating it with a symmetric matrix has a lot of benefits, as we will see. Okay, so let me, discuss a few of the other properties. So the matrix W, as we said, is positive definite and it's also row stochastic, which means that the sum of each of its rows equals one. Um, uh, uh, so for matrices like this, there's a whole theory, the peron Frobenius theory for, for positive stochastic matrices. Um, one of the properties is that uh, its spectral radius is one, so the top eigenvalue is one and it also turns out to be an unrepeated eigenvalue, so it's unique. And the dominant eigenvector corresponding to this eigenvalue is all ones, okay, with a normalization factor of one over n, one over square root of n. Um, there's also, um, a, th these matrices also have an ergodic property, so if you take W to the kth power, so if you apply this filter many, many times, you don't get zero, you get uh, a, a matrix of rank one, um, where this U1 is the uh, dominant uh, left singular, left eigenvalue corresponding to this lambda one, okay? Now, if I go back to this for a second, uh, there's an in, in, interesting intuition behind this. What this tells you is that because the dominant eigenvector is, is just constant, what it means is that this filter W is invariant to constant images, right? So if you give it an image that doesn't vary, then it just gives it back to you. Okay, which is what you would want for, for a denoising filter. So that's nice, it, the, the math and the intuition kind of rhyme. Okay, so let's go on and, and talk about other interpretations of W. Ob obviously, um, the, you can think of W as a probability transition matrix for a Markov chain. So this is sort of the standard interpretation for row stochastic matrices. But also, uh, in terms of graphical models of data and spectral methods, there's interesting interpretation. So let's say you take a pixel at position J and then think about pixels around it or anywhere in the image, um, uh, indexed by I. And now think of this as a node in a tree and these are the branches of the tree. And then, uh, so this is basically a weighted graph with the weights on each of the branches between i and j being kij, okay? So now if you take these weights, k, and construct the matrix k 
decay from them, uh, if you then normalize it the way I just described in the previous slide, and then if you take this W and normalize it further using this, minus I, what you get is precisely what's called the graph Laplacian in, in these other applications. And of course, the graph Laplacian has been used in you know, so many different uh, applications all around. So the point of this is that what I'm going to do is I'm going to be studying the spectrum of this matrix W to gain a lot of insight about processing. And uh, people have been studying the spectrum of the graph Laplacian for all kinds of other applications, really equivalent. Okay, so the study that I'm going to show you, if you know about the spectrum of the graph Laplacian, this stuff ought to make a lot of sense. Okay, so <clears throat> let's take a look at the particular spectrum for the particular Lark filter. This is the one that we invented. Um, so what I've done here is I've taken an image and I've chopped out various patches from this image. And what I'm showing you is the spectrum of the corresponding W matrix for each of these different patches. Okay, so let's start here. If you look at these flat patches, so these are patches where the pixel value doesn't change very much, okay, more or less uniform. What you see is that the spectrum for the corresponding W starts at one, as it should, and it very quickly sort of uh, drops down at a, at a very fast decay rate. Okay, what does that mean? Uh, the very fast decay rate means that the filter is very aggressive. In these flat regions, the filter is doing a lot of denoising. It's doing some very heavy averaging. Now, let's go to uh, an edge. This is sort of a mild edge. And what you see is that the spectrum of the corresponding W has sort of lifted up. What that means is that this filter um, is less aggressive denoising than than these ones. Why? Because it notices that there is some structure here and uh, selectively decides to change the corresponding spectrum to try to protect that edge. Okay? And as we go to more and more complex structures, what ends up happening is that the spectrum sort of lifts. And all of this is, of course, being done automatically by adapting to the, uh, to the data that's given. And when you get, to, you get to fairly complicated textures, then the filter is really being very careful about which directions it is averaging and which directions it's sort of leaving alone. Okay? So it's a very nice to be able to see that because it gives you a real intuition for how the filter is behaving in an adaptive way, uh, in an unsupervised way, to the content of the image that it, that it finds. It also turns out that the, this, this spectrum is very, very stable with respect to noise. So if you take the image and you compute these, now I computed these spectra on the clean image. But if you add noise to this image, um, there's a lot of averaging that goes on in the process of calculating these kernels. So uh, that tends to uh, really tamper down the, the effect of uh, the noise. And so the spectrum stays fairly close to this, even when you add a fairly significant amount of noise to it. OK, so now I mentioned that W is almost symmetric. It turns out that if we actually use a symmetric approximation to W, um, this, gives a, uh, this gives a lot of um, uh, useful uh, uh, properties. So the way we do it is uh, we use something called Sinkhorn's iterative scaling algorithm. This is simply you take W and you normalize the rows and normalize the columns. Then normalize the rows, normalize the columns. And it turns out this thing is guaranteed to converge for any strictly positive W. And what it gives, it gives an approximation which is symmetric, positive definite, and doubly stochastic. It's doubly stochastic because uh, now it's symmetric, it's row stochastic, and column stochastic, so it's doubly stochastic. So this approximation turns out to be good in the sense that it minimizes the cross entropy uh, between the given W and uh, W hat uh, in the class of all doubly stochastic matrices. So it's optimal in this sense. Of course, this is not going to give you a very good metric bound as to how close the approximation W hat is to the given W, but we have that as well. This is some work that we did recently. It turns out that if you look at the Frobenius norm uh, of the difference between these two matrices, you get something that looks like this. So it is basically dominated by the subdominant eigenvalue of W, and then there's these terms that decay with the dimension. Okay? So as the dimension of the matrix gets big, this approximation, these terms uh, collapse, and the approximation just becomes uh, proportional. The approximation error becomes proportional to the subdominant eigenvalue. There's an interesting side note here that some of you may be interested in. It turns out that if you now pick W, if you choose W to be a random row stochastic matrix, 
it means that it has random rows, each of which sum up to one. And of course, these come up all the time in Dirac clay stick breaking processes. Right? So if you take a stick of length one and randomly break it, it always adds up to one. Right? So that becomes the lengths of those pieces become the elements in the row uh, of W. Uh, if you do that, then it turns out the subdominant eigenvalue actually collapses with dimension. Um, and so if you now take this and replace it in here, what you see is that there, the uh, symmetric approximation and the original W are in fact asymptotically equivalent for large enough n. So this approximation is very, very good for, for this situation. Okay, so now um, if I use this symmet uh, symmetrized form, I can write the spectrum uh, of the powers of W this way. And uh, since I know I'm, I'm getting close to being out of time, I'm gonna skip through some of these. I'm gonna be able to approximate the bias and the variance of my estimate using this uh, approximation of the spectrum. And the mean squared error is now the square of the bias plus the trace of the covariance. And if I write the image, underlying image Z in terms of the eigenvectors of W in this basis, then um, let me just direct your attention to this. So this BI, B0I are the coefficients of Z in the column space of V, okay? Um, you get the mean squared error having this expression and sigma squared here being the uh, variance of the noise. Now you can ask, what's the ideal spectrum? So remember, we designed these filters from the beginning without really thinking about their optimality at the end for minimizing mean squared error. So we designed the spectrum for the, we designed the W for the bilateral filter and just kind of do it. Now, if you have this expression, you could ask, you know, sort of clairvoyantly, how would you design W to have the best spectrum possible? Well, I'll just take this quadratic function and, and uh, differentiate it. Well, if you do that, you get the optimal spectrum is, is this formulation, and this is nothing but the Wiener filter, okay? So if you so, somehow um, clairvoyantly knew what this signal to noise ratio was <clears throat> ahead of time, if you knew what these coefficients were ahead of time, then you would design W accordingly to minimize this quantity. And in fact, it turns out that all the state-of-the-art denoising algorithms in one way or another are implicitly struggling to do this even though nobody quite realizes that that's the case. In fact, the algorithm that works the best, which is this BM3D, it's, it's a very well-known algorithm, explicitly tries to estimate these lambda i's from the given noisy data, and then constructs a w by doing v, s, v transpose, where the v that they use is in fact DCT. Okay, they use DCT coefficients. So they don't construct the kernel and then from that go to the w, they actually construct a w using a spectral decomposition with this being optimized. So we can understand now what's going on there. Um, what, before I run out of time, th this part is probably the most important um, segment. So anything that we've done so far has yielded non-ideal filters, okay? Because we, we don't have this clairvoyant idea of what to do. So now the concept is, how do we improve, can we improve these non-ideal filters by some sort of iterative process? And it turns out we can. One way to do it is diffusion. Um, diffusion is nothing but applying this filter W multiple times. And uh, I'll spare you the proof, but basically, uh, if you just rewrite this equation uh, into this form, what you see is that the left-hand side basically becomes a discretization of the derivative, and uh, the right-hand side becomes something that looks very much like the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the Laplacian. So um, if you do diffusion in this way, and this has been done obviously in, in many different places, um, that, that's one way to improve your estimate. And it turns out it has some pluses and minuses. Uh, another way to do it, which is much less known, is something called twicing. This was an idea that was introduced by Tukey back in uh, 1977, John Tukey. More recently, has been rediscovered by uh, Buhlman and Yu uh, called L2 boosting. This has been published mainly in statistics and machine learning literature. And then there's something called Bregman iterations, which has been promulgated by, by uh, folks in, um, uh, uh, in, in applied mathematics, uh, namely Stan Osher and his group. Now, what this does is it, it con constructs an iteration that adds roughness to the estimate. So the iteration, uh, the iterate k is the iterate k minus one plus the filter applied to the residuals, okay? And it turns out that if you do this, so let me just do this for one step and give you an idea of what it looks like. So z1 is z0 plus 
this w times the, the, the first residual. If you rewrite this, what you get is 2i minus w times wi. Well, what's wi? This is one step of diffusion, right? So it's a blurring process. Whereas 2i minus w is a sort of inverse diffusion. Okay, so it basically the two steps of this, you do a step of diffusion and then you do a step of inverse diffusion. And of course you can repeat this over and over again. And it turns out that if you do this, you get very different behaviors for the mean squared error from these two methods. If I write that for diffusion and residual based iteration, here the bias goes up with iterations and the variance goes down. Here the exact reverse happens. The bias goes down and the variance goes up. And then there's a question of which one of these should you use? If you start with a quote unquote dumb W and you want to iteratively improve it, should you use this one or should you use this one? And we've derived conditions, I'll skip through the examples. We've derived conditions that tell you what happens. It turns out the, the, the mathematical condition is that diffusion is better if the filter is kind of weak. In other words, it, uh, it's not very sophisticated, okay? And uh, this is the condition, this is the mathematical condition. And it turns out the left-hand side is nothing but the channel capacity which involves that SNR. So th this it gives you from an information uh, theoretic point of view a condition that has to be satisfied for you to use one filter or another. And the exact reverse, it turns out, this inequality, if you just reverse it, it tells you the residual is better. So it gives you a recipe for designing a W and then deciding how you're going to improve the iterations. Um, there are connections also to, to Bayes. Um, let me skip to this one. This is probably the more interesting one. If you write this regularization formulation, so this is an optimization problem, um, and uh, write a steepest descent iteration of it and then make a comparison between the iterations for steepest descent and the residuals and the diffusion. So if you just write these equations down and then compare the right-hand sides of these two and then compare the right-hand sides of these two, what you get is you can get an expression for the gradient of this uh, uh, stabilization function for this uh, regularization function. And under proper conditions, you can integrate both sides of this to get an expression for the uh, regularization. And what it shows you is that um, the regularization function is basically a quadratic function that involves W, but it's a quadratic function of the residuals. So it's not a standard prior that you might use in, uh, in, in standard Bayesian approach. So it's a, it's a Bayesian, uh, it's sort of a naive Bayesian approach, if you want to think of it that way. Okay, so, uh, well, um, I, just one last example, we also use these weights for um, uh, doing visual search by comparing the coefficients uh, that we get here to uh, a given image, and we're able to very robustly identify objects um, such as this. This is just an example where we have, um, for video, we do the same thing. So here's the uh, query and, and here's the detections that we get. We, there's no requirement for motion estimation, no segmentation or learning. It's just literally matching the, the W coefficients for these images or for these video sequence to the W coefficients in a dense way for, for the sequence that you see on the right hand side. So without any learning. Okay, so that's it. Um, just to conclude, uh, I, I just want to say, I, I, as it turns out, the, the scholars in literature and in film tend to think that there are only seven basic plots. Right? There's comedy, tragedy, quest, rebirth, and every other book, film ever made is some combination of, of these ideas. So in some sense, we, we've arrived at this point where I think there's, there's sort of basic plots for modern image processing as well. And I think there are adaptiveness to the data, use of non-parametrics, and doing these kinds of iterations. And everything that we've done has sort of revolved around these three main concepts over the last few years. And so as I've hopefully shown you, there are many applications and still more to be, to be discovered. You know, I'm sorry I, I went over time, but that's it. Thank you. I guess still we have uh, time for a couple of questions, and it's a workshop anyway, so. Yeah. Two questions. Um, the one is in your derivation. You uh, mentioned that you want to get the dimensionality of the W matrix to go to a very large number for the, uh, for the, the proofs that you showed. Mm -hmm. Typically, for computational expedience, we keep the search radius. Right. Much smaller than the whole image. Correct. Right. How does it break down? Well, so when I say large, um, I'm talking about if you take the uh, 
if you take the, the window size to be, let's say, uh, 15 by 15, that's big enough for a lot of these bounds to be very accurately true. And then following up on that, I mean, typically for, from psychovisuals, MSE is a pretty bad matrix. Yes. So you, you, know, you show the optimal filter and you get the Wiener, but you know, often that psychovisual is not really the best case. Right. Unfortunately, I don't have a psychovisual way to quantify performance. And as soon as I have it, I will try to optimize it. <laughs> so that's still an ongoing thing, an ongoing struggle to, to, to understand. Any other so ones? Maybe one more question, and then we proceed with the next slide. If there is one more question. Yeah. Well, when you show your light, um, mm -hmm. you show that the flat surface, it's, it's not very aggressive to flat surface. <coughs> it's very, no, it's, it's aggressive to flat surfaces, but. It's not aggressive to when there is a flat right. surface. So, does the model know anything about a noise? Because you said it's, it's, yes. it, it's robust with respect to noise, but if I add noise to some flat surface, mm -hmm. I add some structure actually. So, so, so then it becomes non aggressive. Right, so it becomes non aggressive in particular directions, and it decides which directions to become non aggressive in because of the fact that we're co computing that covariance matrix. Remember, the covariance matrix C that I showed you <laughs> is being computed from the gradients. And so basically, the idea is that even with addition of noise, the dominant orientation within that patch is still identifiable. And that's really the key factor here. So the filter is able to decide, OK, in this direction, there is a discontinuity that I want to try to preserve. But in this other direction, everything is flat, so I'm going to be aggressively denoising there. I hope that helps.